This is Hubwonk. I'm Joe Salvaggi. Welcome to Hubwonk, a podcast of Pioneer Institute, a think tank in Boston. Modern medicine has offered Americans longer, healthier lives. But even those who age most successfully will need to deal with a diminishment of capacity and the eventual need for support with transportation, meals, errands, and assistance at home. This need for long-term care, as it is known, is becoming an issue of national concern owing to the so-called baby boom generation entering their seventh decade and the growing cost for sustaining private long-term care options over many years of aging. Policymakers and individuals themselves agree that long-term care is best delivered in one's own home and community, but institutions that support that delivery have been slow to emerge and leave the vast majority of middle-class individuals with the risk of eventually ending up in a public long-term facility after their assets are depleted. How can we reorient our long-term care support institutions in a way that both address Americans' longer, healthier lives and do it in a way that is affordable for individuals and will not strain our social welfare resources? My guest today is Stuart Butler, Senior Fellow at Brookings Institution. Mr. Butler has played a prominent role in the debate over healthcare equity and reform, focusing on social determinants of health and the use of market approaches and state innovation. He has advised legislators in the U.S. Congress and Mitt Romney while he served as Massachusetts governor. Mr. Butler has written extensively on the challenges of long-term care in America and with a team of ideologically diverse experts, developed policy recommendations for cultivating institutions and structures to support the long-term care of all of us as we age. When I return, I'll be joined by Brookings Institution Senior Fellow, Stuart Butler. Okay, we're back. This is Hubwonk. I'm Joe Salvaggi, and I'm pleased to be joined by Senior Fellow at Brookings Institution, Stuart Butler. Welcome to Hubwonk, Stuart. Pleasure, thank you. All right, before we talk about uh, today's topic, which is uh, long-term care, uh, I'd like our listeners to know something about your impressive background in facilitating healthcare reform. In fact, healthcare reform right here in Massachusetts. Uh, you've, of course, advised members of Congress, but you've also uh, were uh, an advisor to our former governor Romney here in Massachusetts. You helped develop uh, healthcare reforms in Massachusetts that have since been labeled uh, Romney Care or a uh, precursor even to the ACA or Obamacare. Uh, where did your passion for healthcare policy begin? Well, really, I think from the very first time I came to the United States, uh, which was in 1979. And, uh, you know, I, some of the first things I did was actually write about why uh, America should not adopt the system that I lived under, the sort of socialist national health system. Um, and, I, and But as I spent more time here, I got more and more kind of involved in understanding the, the healthcare system itself here, and particularly the employment-based system and the pros and cons, very many cons of that. And that kind of drew me into it. Uh, and, and I really uh, find it as an issue, healthcare, quite fascinating because it's, it's an issue which you have to approach on multiple levels. I mean, there are a lot of moral questions, you know, who should we care for? And what is res private responsibility? What is public responsibility? It's technically a difficult and interesting issue. You know, it's this blend of markets and public goods and so forth. So I just uh, got sort of sucked into it, if you like. And now more, more recently, I've been very involved in looking at some of the dimensions that affect care, that and affect health, I should say, that are not sort of medical in nature. So housing, transportation, nutrition, what we call the social determinants of health, and, and the need to have collaboration across sectors to enable people to be healthy for most of their life. And I, and I find that's really a very, very fascinating area because it gets you very much into sort of civil society questions and, and so on. So it's, it's an issue that just drew me in <laughs> uh, throughout my career. Wonderful. Well, you, um, you revealed your, uh, your initial preference or your suspicion with, uh, let's say, public run uh, healthcare systems. And I uh, mentioned in your intro there, uh, you want to understand how markets and uh, private and public uh, dynamics work. Uh, you're now at Brookings Institution. I, I think you're the first of my guests from Brookings, uh, uh, but you are someone who loves uh, to try to harness the power of markets to solve many of our public policy challenges. How did you find your way to Brookings? 
Well, I'm, I'm sorry I'm the first uh, from Berkeley. So I should encourage you to uh, uh, invite some others in the future because there's a wide range of people actually at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I must say most of my friends are more on the liberal side than on the conservative side. Well, I, I was at the Heritage Foundation, as I think you know, for 35 years. That's actually when I first uh, encountered uh, the Pioneer Institute. It's when I first encountered Charlie Baker, your, 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 your governor, uh, uh, in think, when he was in the think tank world. Uh, and I was very focused on looking at, at markets in that way, as you said, to solve problems. And I still very strongly uh, believe that. Uh, I think there are, there are really two reasons why I uh, kind of began to look at, at other approaches or blending other approaches into, into markets. One is the challenge of dealing with people who um, are low income, who've got uh, you know, really uh, a lot of complicated backgrounds and so on. And also, as I said at the beginning, there's there is a notion, I think, that healthcare in America is something that as a society, we need to somehow make sure people have an adequate level. And I think that's just, that's just a description of how people think in America. That's not true in a lot of other countries. So I think that challenge was there. Then in addition, I think um, being at, at Heritage for that long, I, I started beginning to think that I wanted to look at issues which really were not so much front and center in the legislative area. Um, Heritage is very focused on, on legislation, on Capitol Hill. That's really why it was started. Brookings, on the other hand, um, uh, not only does that, but also um, really fosters work in a whole range of areas which have a very long kind of shelf life, if you like, uh, really looking at more local state issues and so on. So I was kind of drawn uh, to move away from an organization that was focused on Capitol Hill and legislation and so on, and, and looking much more at an organization that had a wide range of views and also uh, you know, allowed me to explore some of the areas, the dimensions of healthcare that it wasn't so easy for me to do before. Wonderful. Well, you've uh, encouraged me to take a second look at uh, Brookings. Thanks. Okay. Um, so let's get back, let's get right to our um, conversation uh, about long-term care. Let's, let's start at the beginning. You've, you've studied this extensively as you, over a long arc of a a, a, a very uh, um, uh, uh, wonderful career. Um, what is long-term care? What we mean by long-term care is really caring for people with a chronic condition over a long period of time. Uh, a chronic condition could mean just getting old and getting frailer. Uh, it could also mean uh, somebody with a disability. But it's the idea of dealing with the multiple needs of somebody that has a long kind of chronic condition. So when we think of long-term care, as opposed to say healthcare, we're not so much thinking of applying uh, remedies and a lot of intensive clinical care and like that. We're really looking much more at, at the needs of people in their daily lives and, and how they can kind of live with a condition or aging and becoming more frail. So it focuses a lot more on uh, providing sort of just the basic daily needs of people, that kind of care, social care, if you like, as it's, that's actually what it's called in the UK, for example. Uh, so it, that's the difference. And, and we're really mainly talking about older people who are not able to uh, take care of themselves any longer, probably have some medical condition, maybe cognitive decline. Uh, that's a population which is growing and is a very, turns out to be a very costly um, part of the population to serve. Now, is this, um, so you made a very clear distinction. This is not healthcare, but it, rather all the attending needs of someone yeah, who's getting older. Yeah, it overlaps older. obviously with healthcare. I mean, people who in a long-term care facility will often need healthcare, but the point is that their, their living situation, their round the clock uh, needs are much more just basic needs of daily living, feeding, bathing, uh, you know, these kinds of issues. Now, um, we don't need to be a demographer to know that uh, we are, we have an aging population. The baby boomers are, are uh, crossing the threshold. I think 10,000 uh, baby boomers retire every day. Um, is that demographic shift making this challenge even more acute? Absolutely. You know, and, and in a sense, we're a victim of our own success in this because if you look at the, at the typical pattern of people, you know, when I was born in the 1940s and 50s and right through maybe the 70s, 
Uh, people would have a reasonably healthy life. Uh, they'd be in the workforce and so on to their 60s or maybe early 70s. And then they would succumb to some disease fairly quickly. Uh, it could be a heart condition, cancer, or whatever. What's happened, of course, in the last several decades is that we've managed to take care of those issues. We've managed to uh, put off the time in which people die. So now we have a population that for a lengthy period, maybe two or three decades in some cases, uh, are not able to function at 100%. Uh, they're in decline uh, and they need increasing needs. Um, they need increasing care. Uh, and that's what we're seeing in the future. So it's the fact, it's actually the paradox of our success in healthcare has actually made our need for long-term care much greater. Well, I guess that's good news in there somewhere. Right? That's right. <laughs> okay. Now, now, where is uh, long-term care provided at this time? Well, really, actually, most long-term care is provided by uh, family and friends in one's home. I mean, most people age in their own home. They do get care. But then when you look at more institutional care, if they're not able to do that, if they don't have that kind of support, we see the growth and there's a big expansion of so-called assisted living, that means people living in an apartment with a set of services provided in that facility in some way. That's typically for people who are still, you know, in, in, in reasonable shape. They do need help. They do need assistance. They do need maybe somebody to come in and, and uh, provide some sort of basic services and look after their medication and things like that. But they can function. Uh, beyond that, we think of, we, we think of institutions which, which we call nursing homes. Uh, in terms of people where they really need a much more intense level of care. Uh, they may be in cognitive decline. They may have Alzheimer's. Um, they need a lot more assistance and that's really expensive. I mean, the average cost of a shared room in a nursing home today is almost $100,000 a year. So just think if somebody has to spend 10 years in a nursing home, uh, that's approximately a million dollars. That, so that's, that's why a, we have a problem. <laughs> that's quite a, a lot of, uh, you, you've framed it in a very large range, obviously, uh, or not obviously, if we use uh, family members to support us, uh, that's presumably free, not, not free time, but uh, we don't pay those uh, right. caregivers, but in a uh, nursing home, we do. How do uh, we now, uh, as a society, pay for, let's say, in your case, the, the most expensive uh, scenario right. uh, um, where one is, um, uh, has Alzheimer's? Sure. Well, in the first instance, people pay out of pocket. Uh, people who are middle class, who are not eligible for Medicaid for, for the poor, uh, pay out of their own pocket. And, and the result of that is, of course, that in many instances, people are, they, they thought they were going to have enough to live on in their retirement, and they don't. They run out of money. When they run out of money, they then become, by definition, eligible for public support through the Medicaid program, which is um, a shared public, a, a shared state and federal program. So um, it can be very, it is very expensive. It's an increasing share of Medicaid and it's a heavy burden on the state as well as the federal government. Uh, and because of the shared nature of the Medicaid program. Now, now we've uh, share, you know, exposed our uh, intuition that prefers a private solution. Why can't uh, in this situation, since we all know we're all hopefully going to live mm -hmm. along age, why doesn't the private insurance model work in this scenario? You know, that's a, it's a very interesting question. And it's one that I spent a lot of time looking at. And I actually have private insurance uh, for long-term care, but that's not usual. Uh, there, there are a couple of major reasons why it's not, why the private insurance market is not filling what would seem to be an obvious gap. I mean, people buy life insurance, they buy homeowners insurance. It's like normal to do that. But buying long-term care insurance is not something which people typically do. One reason actually is, 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 is rather interesting and curious, which is people have an aversion to thinking about, the, about being in a nursing home and long-term care. There's a lot of evidence from surveys that people just flinch from the idea of thinking about protecting themselves. They don't want to think about it. Um, a more specific business reason is that long-term care insurance, actually for some of the reasons we just were talking about, is an extremely difficult product to actually price uh, and to sell. The difficulty of pricing is that we don't really know. If you're, if you're in the insurance business in this area, it's very hard 
to predict actually what the, the cost to the company providing insurance is going to be. We know it's large, but it's uncertain. You know, medical breakthroughs that we're talking about means that people likely will live longer in the future. And so the actor is trying to say, how do we price this risk? It's extremely difficult in long-term care. And if you build in uncertainty and price for uncertainty, it becomes very, very expensive. So, you know, if people are delaying buying insurance because they don't really want to think about it until they're maybe in their 50s or 60s, and if the insurance company finds it hard to predict what is likely to be a very high cost, then it becomes extremely expensive. If it's extremely expensive, fewer people can afford it. And if fewer people are, can afford it, only the ones that really know they're going to need it and so on want to buy it. And it becomes a spiral. And that's why what we actually have, it's an insurance industry that has been steadily going out of business for the last 15, 20 years. Fewer and fewer companies, more and more restrictive uh, coverage. It's a market that just isn't functioning because of this enormous uncertainty. So we have a, a market failure, and I think you laid out the reasons for that uh, uh, very clearly. So let's talk about then the solutions if it's not uh, uh, insurance necessarily. We've got a spectrum of solutions, let's say from, let's go with the entirely private to entirely public. Um, I read some of your work talking about uh, in the ideal private solution, uh, this concept of uh, uh, home or community care, uh, specifically uh, this village movement. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you from Beacon Hill. We have a, a right. concept called Beacon Hill Village, I think was the, the beginning of this movement. The late great John Sears was a friend of mine and uh, I think pretty impressive. I think that that's the ideal. Why don't you share with our listeners what that model is and where it works? Yes, um, I mean, I think one step to try to deal with this issue is to say, look, let's see if we can make it more possible for people to remain in their own home instead of paying $100,000 a year to go into a nursing home. Let's see if we can make that more possible. And that involves, I think, a number of steps. I mean, one is to get, if you like, the community to rally around older people, which is what happens in many, many countries. This is not unusual. It's not unusual even in this country. So ideas like the village movement, which is really a way of structuring um, social capital within a community by launching um, um, a program called Villages, which basically recruits volunteers in the community. Often these are people in their middle and, and old age who are beginning to think about these things themselves, but are able-bodied and organize them uh, to help individuals in the community with specific needs. And by specific needs, we, things, we mean things like cooking, cleaning, uh, transportation, so that they can stay in their own home safely and adequately for a long time. So it's really the community kind of rallying around. You can add layers on something like this. You can have what we call home and community-based services in this country, which is, which is where um, the state or the uh, county government and, and the uh, local government uh, actually provides so, some level of services to supplement what a family can provide. So these are social workers, nurses, and so on. So there's a lot we can do to actually uh, make it less likely that somebody's going to need to go into expensive assisted living and particularly um, nursing home living. We can do something in that area. Um, so that is going on and we're seeing some steps and it's, uh, I think, a very important piece of the equation, but it's only for a certain part of the population once somebody gets beyond beyond the stage where they can live safely in their own home, they have Alzheimer's, they've fallen several times, they've got you know issues like that, then you really can't avoid um, getting into the more uh, you know expensive and more well developed long term care service area. And that's where our challenge is to figure out the financing of that. So at the core, this this uh, a private solution, if you will, is very, very useful for um, helping to reduce, let's say, overall costs, but yes. ultimately it doesn't solve every problem. So let's talk about uh, mm -hmm. on the other end of the continuum, a more um, social welfare, if, if you will, or, uh, um, you know, what we have now is um, Medicare or Medicaid in the case where someone has depleted their resources. Say more about um, what the challenges are for that kind of intervention or support. Well, um, I mean, in one sense, the challenge is, is the growing expense. We're seeing this as, 
a major growth in entitlements. It's as, as a proportion of state budgets, it's Medicaid for long-term care is growing and growing and it's becoming an increasing burden. So, so there's this challenge of how do we kind of pay for the public side? In addition, I think a lot of us are looking at, are there some ways to build in a much more private element to this, recognizing that it's not going to solve everything, but looking at ways of reviving the, um, the long-term care insurance industry uh, in, in some way. And that's a kind of the second piece, just to, just to deal with the public side for, for a moment. Uh, I think there, the, the, the evidence is how can we rethink and redesign long-term care facilities in a way that can bring down costs, can make them more attractive and available to people and so on. I'm involved in a, actually in a project uh, taking place right now, run by an organization called Convergence. And the term of it, the title of it is Rethinking uh, Care for Older Adults. And that's looking at, at these big institutions, the big nursing homes and say, can we think of that differently in the future and finance it uh, differently? So looking at smaller facilities, which are more like smaller uh, units in the, in the community where there can be some mixture of public support in a, in a sort of traditional nursing home setting, but in a smaller setting with much more support from the local community and so on instead. So in other words, looking at, at, at sort of breaking up this monolith idea of a nursing home and looking at different ways of providing that care at different, at, at different uh, levels and in different ways. Some people on my, some of my friends at, uh, at Brookings um, would argue that we've got to kind of bite the bullet and say, uh, nursing home care is something that really has to be publicly financed, not just for the very poor, but for people who have been middle-class, have quote, done the right thing, end quote, saved, tried, but just have got, you know, facing this impossible task of, of, of paying for this care. And, and maybe we ought to have an extension of Medicare, which currently does not cover long-term care, but maybe a new part of Medicare that does that paid for with a, well, you know, with a, uh, a payroll tax. That's a very expensive solution, uh, but that is certainly something that uh, some people are arguing for. Now, were we to do something like that, um, again, in your, uh, when you first uh, offered an answer, you mentioned something about um, an insurance solution, private insurance mm -hmm. solution. I suppose what you would do is perhaps have a, a backstop whereby the government steps in for worst case long tail events whereby someone is extremely expensive, but the uh, private insurance pays for, let's say, reasonably predictable, um, not catastrophic costs. Right. Um, but were we to go to a more public um, let's say uh, long-term care for all. I don't. I don't have the slogan yet. Uh, wouldn't that create um, the moral hazard that discourages folks from buying insurance at all? In, in other words, uh, once we go down that route, route there certainly will be no more long-term uh, insurance at all. Yes, I think that's absolutely the case. Uh, if, for example, let me just say how one might do that. If one was looking at a completely public program, you might say that well, Medicaid, which currently does cover, that's what most people. If they have, if they're not very well off, or if they spend down all their money, they end up on Medicaid. Some people argue that Medicaid itself might be expanded into up the income level for people uh, needing long-term care, not for everybody, not for younger people, but for older people needing long-term care. And you're absolutely right. If you do that, then what is the incentive to insure yourself, or, or what's the incentive to put money aside to, to pay for? long-term care. Most people are in long-term care for maybe two or three years, and then they die. Some people do leave long-term care. Um, but, um, but, but if, you, if you're going to be living in long-term care for 15 years, there's almost no way most middle-class people can save enough to cover that, that cost. So yes, if you were to say you will be covered uh, you know, after a year or six months or something like that, then of course, what's the incentive to, to save for that? And I think that's one of the, that to me is the biggest weakness of those efforts. Now, I have to say that those have the, the other approach of saying, let's look at, at a more limited approach of saying, for example, um, people pay into a, a program that only kicks in if they've been in 
uh, a nursing home for two or three years, or they, they meet a higher expenditure. So it doesn't cover uh, routine long-term care costs. That can be a way of still encouraging people to get insurance and to save for that, that part of their expenditure, which is not covered by the public program. And the other thing it does, which is I think really very important, uh, is with regard to the long-term care insurance industry, as you described, the, the so-called long tail list, uh, risk associated with that. If you don't know as an insurer, as I said earlier, what the total liability might be, it's very hard to price the insurance. If you do know that the federal government is gonna come in after a certain point and cover costs, you've got a more definable, knowable risk. It's a kind of the known unknown, <laughs> not the unknown <laughs> unknown uh, that we have today. Uh, and I think, and, and part of the argument for doing this is to revive the long-term, the private long-term care insurance industry. And if you do that, that takes a lot of the pressure off Medicaid. So um, in other words, if, if you look at a targeted catastrophic federal program, the two critical results of that can be reviving long-term care private insurance so that most people in fact would be covered that way. And it actually takes the pressure off states and the federal government in the Medicaid program. So it's not ideally, in my view, it's not an add-on, it's not a new entitlement, but it actually reduces the pressure on one entitlement, Medicaid, at the same time as you actually encourage people to, uh, you actually encourage the private insurance industry to kind of resuscitate and to, and to grow and to begin to fill the gap for most people who need long-term care insurance. Indeed, as I like to say on the show, the government doesn't have its own money. So if it's spending a lot of money on long-term care for everyone, uh, that's money it's not spending on other things government Absolutely. may be uh, needed to do. So uh, we, I think you've done a wonderful job of framing uh, the argument, the debate. Um, let's take it to, um, I, I know you, at Brookings, you like to take the whole picture uh, and all the many layers of the, of the issue. Um, but let's go step back to legislation. Is there anything being actively proposed by one side or the other? Or perhaps there's some, as you say, your convergence project is, is to find some sort of common ground where you can uh, right. uh, contemplate these ideas and develop uh, more thoughtful legislation. Is there anything going on now in Congress to address this, let's say, tidal wave of, of uh, older people? Yes. Well, I think the, this, this middle ground approach is gaining some momentum now because I think those who supported a, a purely public program are in sticker shock when it comes to what kind of payroll taxes would you need to totally fund that. They recognize the unintended consequences of people not saving, adding to the cost, the moral hazard issue and so on. So I think they're sort of open, they are open to looking much more at some kind of blended, some mixed system. And similarly people, I think some of my more libertarian friends, I can, I think recognize that it's really there's no way in which we can see a purely private measure. So yes, there is legislation. It's called actually the WISH Act. And it is along the lines that I mentioned. It's, it's a modest program that is designed to have a payroll tax that would finance catastrophic coverage through the federal government. Uh, it's been introduced by Congressman Susie of, uh, of New York. Uh, and uh, it's really a discussion bill at this stage, like a lot of pieces of legislation. It's not expected to pass soon. It's not being pushed right now. But it, by, by putting a, a, an actual piece of legislation, it allows people to kick it around and examine it and, and run the numbers, see what impact it would have. And we're at a stage now of beginning to look at, well, what would be the financial implications of a bill like this? What impact would it have on states, for example? Because it would mean um, a reduction in, in the need for Medicaid to cover this increasingly large proportion of middle-class people who run out of money. Uh, if that's the case, there's clearly a benefit to states. Well, we're beginning to start to calculate that, to see, to examine what that would be. Uh, and also, of course, what the impact on the federal side would be because of the federal share uh, of Medicaid. We're beginning to look at, at, well, to what degree would the private insurance market revive? So right now, there's a lot of conversations going on with insurance companies that have been in the business and, the, and moving out of it like Unum uh, and, and other companies like that to, to begin to kind of get a sense of how 
how well and how quickly could we accept could we expect private insurance to revive under, under this legislation so it's a very active piece of legislation it's not going to be passed anytime in the next few months or anything like that but we at least now have um, a vehicle to examine to explore and to see what the potential benefits would be of it and i think that's a really important step as at the same time as we're seeing more and more uh, uh, interest and examination of the delivery of, of long-term care, how we actually do it, looking at, at how nursing homes should be reorganized, how they should be re regulated at the, at the federal level and, and also at the state level, how these ideas like villages kind of fit in with all of this. That's going on. It's a very exciting time, actually, to be looking at the area of long-term care. Indeed, you established that uh, you know, if, if you are able to, quote unquote, solve this conundrum, uh, it would have a salutary effect on uh, state budgets. Um, many of our listeners are either legislators or policymakers themselves at the state level, and that's more often what we talk about on our show. Uh, what could uh, states like Massachusetts, um, who have led the way in, in reform in many ways, uh, what could they do to help uh, facilitate this move towards a uh, I, I don't know if you characterize a blended solution between a more robust private health uh, insurance and and a catastrophic backstop by the federal government. Well, I think uh, in addition to obviously looking at the federal legislation itself and weighing in on that and beginning to look uh, as a state, well, what impact would a piece of legislation like that have on, on the state's Medicare, Medicaid budget? And so I think that's obviously one of the, every state should be doing that and examining that and encouraging states uh, to look at what the implications would be and to come back with, with suggestions, recommendations, you know, and so forth. I think in addition, it's very important to then also look at the delivery side, as we talked about earlier, that how we actually deliver services uh, to people. That involves looking at things like the regulation. One of the things we found in a number of states is that it's very difficult to actually create much smaller kinds of nursing homes, because typically state regulation is is designed for very large institutions and so the regulation of both facilities the regulation of life of licensing for uh, for workers because many of these smaller approaches to dealing with the problem actually use um, workers in different ways they, they you know have people doing multiple kinds of jobs sometimes occupational licensing may, at the state level makes that impossible so it can be very frustrating so I think looking at regulation and, and giving greater flexibility for more creative approaches of that kind. Then I think it's really important to kind of get out of the state and wander around, have a look at what some other states are doing. Um, Vermont, uh, your friend and neighbor there, uh, has got a program called the SASH program, which has been very effective at reducing costs by actually uh, getting the, the state and the county services to cooperate more effectively. So some of this is pretty basic stuff. When you're dealing with older people, you've got to have the housing department, social services, Medicaid, actually work better together. And you can do a lot to um, keep your total costs down and improve people's quality of life by doing that. So have a look around uh, at, at other states. You know, Vermont's not just such a stupid place after all. Uh, and, and I think also that do remember that uh, in the Medicaid program and in, in several other programs, it's possible to go to the federal government and say, we, we want to do things differently in our Medicare and Medicaid program. So look at the idea of waivers, so-called waivers from the federal government. If you've got an approach that you think makes sense for Massachusetts, um, do as you've often done before, go to the federal government and say, give us some flexibility in the programs for a number of years in return for evaluating what we're doing to explore some of these creative areas of, uh, of long-term care. That's a wonderful way to uh, end our show. Uh, for our listeners who want to read more about your research and the work you're doing um, at either at Convergence or at Brookings, where can we find you? Uh, if you go on to uh, uh, the Brookings website, you just look at, uh, at, at brookings.edu, you'll see, uh, you'll be able to see the work that I'm doing uh, in this area. And then um, if you look at the, the total, the name of Convergence is the Convergence Center for Policy uh, Resolution. Uh, if you look at them, you'll see the, uh, uh, the work that we're doing through convergence to bring different stakeholders together, nursing homes, others uh, together 
to actually explore this uh, this area. Well, thank you very much. Your fund of information is a very uh, complex and uh, interesting topic, and I. Uh, uh, I appreciate you dedicating so much of your, your time and, and research on it. Thank you for joining Hubwonk today, Stuart. Right. Thank you. My pleasure. This has been another episode of Hubwonk, a podcast of Pioneer Institute. If you enjoyed today's episode, there are several ways to support the show. It would be easier for you and better for us if you subscribe to Hubwonk on your iTunes podcatcher. If you'd like to help make it easier for others to find Hubwonk, it would be great if you offer a five-star rating or a favorable review. If you have ideas or comments or suggestions for me about future topics for future episodes, please email me at hubwonk at pioneerinstitute.org. Please join me next week for a new episode of Hubwonk.